Admiral Gregory Quinn is on Relva 7 and has requested to be beamed aboard the Enterprise immediately. Wesley Crusher has a friend named Jake. And Mordok constructed the, checks notes, Mordok strategy. Hello, everybody, <laughs> and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby. Hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 1, Episode 18, Coming of Age, written by Sandy Freeze, directed by Michael Vahar. This was March 12th, 1988. We've got a fantastic guest. We are absolutely thrilled to have John Putch joining us today. Hello, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. We also have a very special thanks to give out to Grandpa One, a.k.a. Tim Baum, for sponsoring this entire season. Let's just wow. get right into it. John, you yes. played this guy. Yes, thank you Mordock. for having me. Yes. And uh, before we hit record, Denise asked you how long that makeup took, which is probably the question you'll get for the rest of your life. What's the answer to it? Well, it, was, it had to be at least four, four and a half to five hours because they called me at Figure if your call time's 3.30 and you get in the chair, then uh, my set call was 7 a.m. So what's that? Three and a half, almost four hours. So And sometimes it'd be later because, you know, they they delay or move something or something. And, and yeah, I was asleep in the chair. So it was a really long process. and But it was a very lucrative uh, guest spot because they'd have to uh, force you to come in inside of 12 hours pretty much every day that I worked. So... Mm -hmm. um, it turned out to be a nice, you know, extra cheese uh, for for coming in so early, thanks to Screen Actors Guild and their rules. So, mm -hmm. yeah. but yeah, How I fell asleep it, in the chair. Huh? How long did it take to take off? Oh, well, not as long. But I, it, you know, I had never done an appliance uh, a character before, so I didn't realize that they needed to take it off for yeah. you. And yeah. I, no one told me that until the, you know, the AD or the PA said, yep, you got to go back to makeup. I go, but I'm done. He goes, no, no, no. <laughs> they need the stuff. And I just assumed I was to, to rip it off and go home and clean up like you do in the theater. And uh, no, so I, I, it took, um, I don't know, half an hour to get it off. And it was rough. They'd be painting yeah. that, that stuff on your head, that acetone and stuff. And it was, uh, it was bad for the skin back then. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, um... uh, People yeah. don't re realize that, you know, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, they, they, they're only focused on the, you know, application, but man, you gotta, you gotta painstakingly get that removed. And, and you're, and at the end of the day, all you do want to do is get home and, and just rip it off, you know, but yeah. you gotta sit there a whole second level process. Lunchtime was always unique for me because um, when when everyone would go to lunch, it's a walk away on the Paramount lot. So they give you an hour and, you know, you'd walk to the commissary and me being a Star Trek fan prior to the show, uh, you know, you you were in the commissary and you'd see Star Trek Starfleet characters walking <laughs> around with their trays you know, and there, and it was like I, I took note of it and was just so amazed by it. And I would, of course, tell my wife everything when I got home. Guess who I saw in commissary today? I saw I saw a Vulcan, and I saw I saw a three, <laughs> I saw a transporter guy. I saw some gold. <laughs> I saw some red. You know, I had the whole thing. And then there I was in the blue thing, and I clearly was the anomaly because everyone was staring at me, uh, and I felt like a. I, I don't know. I felt like a, a monster and uh, and I couldn't eat when I got there. I, you know, I, it, everything would break off if I ate. So I had to do soups and I had to, you know, they brought me sippy things during the day and it was hard. I was I was uh, tired and hungry at the end of every day. Yeah. But, uh, you know, fun. Nevertheless, I don't think I could uh, get through that today at this but it was oh, wow. worth it, at least for those of us who watched it, maybe not for you. But mm -hmm. as Denise mentioned, she said before we recorded that this was the best makeup she's seen so mm. far. Uh, and uh, the Emmy Awards tend to agree because this episode was nominated for Outstanding mm -hmm. uh, Makeup in a television series. And this specific thing uh, nominated, uh, that was, uh, of course, Michael Westmore. Um, so... Great accolades there, and it was, you know, yeah. noticed, which is not something that happens well, very often why. with yeah. Star Trek. Well, it was nominated, but it didn't win. Correct? Yeah. I mean, what could it? What possibly beat out this? 
My uh, guess is uh, something non-sci-fi. They hate sci-fi. They're so well, I, and also remember, <laughs> you're season one, and you're just becoming a super hit, and you know how they are. And then, but he got his Emmys later. I mean, there were Emmys yeah. delivered later in year. Were there not? I'm pretty sure there were. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't know actually. Yeah, I no, mean, there were. Yeah, there were. Yeah, he's got plenty of Emmys. Yeah, <laughs> I he's, got, more. he's got a, yeah. a ton he's of. He's all right. Are, yeah. Are we allowed to swear on this show or not? I mean, I'll keep it. <laughs> we can use the word 57 as in 57 Emmys uh, uh, that Next Generation gosh. was nominated for. We'll check on how many they actually won. 50- but that's wow. Gigantic. Oh, it won 19. Yeah. There you go. So that's exactly one third. If my math is correct. Yeah. Won 19 Emmys. Yeah. I mean, they're all, the they were all. Gen? All in makeup and, and all in makeup? No, different. Oh, that's no everything. Acting? Different categories, yeah. Any acting Emmys? Well, they don't I'll tell they you who didn't win an Emmy. They don't give acting Emmys to sci fi. No, 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 they don't. Which is terrible because, you know, it is acting. I don't know why they don't qualify it. Um, it, it just, if there's a good story, it should just get nominated. Yeah, to, to this day, it's that that's the case, isn't it? It's, it's kind of say, a discriminatory thing. It's it's a yeah. discrimination against science fiction. <laughs> yeah. And actually, yeah. You, you joke, but it, it, we've always felt that way, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but John, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. You mentioned you are a Star Trek fan. Mm-hmm. Do you remember when you first laid eyes upon Star Trek and dreamt that someday you'll be a monster at the commissary in the name <laughs> of Star Trek? <laughs> no, never. And, uh, you know, I love the original show and uh, as a as a young youngster. And, uh, you know, it was when this thing came about, when they announced they were doing this. I mean, the, just this town. Well, the, the Star Trek fans were all, we were all a flutter because we had the movie at that point. We I think we had a couple of the movies uh, at that point. And now there was the, the, the new show. We were just dying. And uh, luckily. I knew Junie Lowry Johnson from years ago, who is a very loyal casting director and brings in all of us on most of this, you know, whenever she can. And I read for the pilot for the, the I read for one of the characters on the first show. I don't even remember, but she brought me in on everything. And mm-hmm. uh, I came in uh, over the years on the uh, first season on uh, on this show. And, and, you know, this one hit. So uh, I got in that way, but um I never dreamt I'd be on the show, but when it, when we all heard it was coming, you know, every as we all do, our, our little actors in the town, we're all we're all excited about it and trying to get in on it and hoping it goes. And uh, but yeah, no, I, I I did pretty good in the '80s when I was an actor. Of course, I don't I'm a director now, but I don't I did the '80s were kind of good. I was the right age. I had a uh, I was slim. I had hair. You know, I had all that. I didn't. You know, I was I was charactery, but not, uh, you know, uh, so I I I remember uh, doing well in the 80s and then it all just fell apart in the mid 90s. And that's when I started veering off to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Uh, when you first come on the screen, you have this kind of harmonica looking contraption. What what, what? Right. do you remember? How yeah. Beautiful? It looked so we like must, we, we, we must discuss yeah. this item. Uh, I've discussed it before <laughs> and it, it is it was a, a, a marvelous little gadget that they uh, created for this character who was from a water planet, meaning mm, okay. that's why I have gills. If you look behind Ryan, they've they put gills oh, yeah. back where my ears are and they're and these tendrils. It was a very, you know, fish like character. That's what they told me. And uh, so they want they needed something here, which would lead the viewer to believe that this is what I used to breathe oxygen when I really, need uh, to be, you know, gilling or something. So they had this little license to gill. Yeah, this <laughs> thing that clipped on to my uh, I had a you know, I had the the uh, the girdle on under the tunic and they clipped this thing in and it held there. It had a battery in it. And uh, they had little LEDs, which was amazing back then, because I, how do you get those, you know? And uh, <laughs> and it, it uh, and they dropped little ice crystals. Uh, Alan, um, what was the prop man's name? Alan. Oh, uh, he was so nice, sweet Alan. Anyway, yeah. he 
he'd, he'd come over and drop little ice crystals in uh, that were uh, dry ice every, mm -hmm. like literally every shot. And I would have to hold my head a certain way so you couldn't see over the edge. So the camera couldn't see over the edge to see the little ice crystals. So, and then they to, to add even more uh, difficulty to doing everything, uh, I had to like try to puff into it to disperse, you know, <laughs> clouds because they didn't have, you know, smoke VFX at, or they couldn't track it at the time, you know, all this stuff that you can do now. So uh, I had to like stand there at a certain level like this most of the time. And then I, I could only cock my head this way and that, because if I ever did this, they go, oh, no, 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 camera operator would say, no, 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 can't, can't do that. I can see the ice. And I go, okay. And can you try to puff into that as you're saying this line? <laughs> oh, and I go, no. I said, I'm talking. So if I talk and try to puff, I'd have to puff in my nose. I said, I can yeah. do it in between. I can do it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, right before I talk, right after I talk. And that's what I tried to do. Plus, it changes oh. your performance. But uh, that's right. The, the property master, the prop master was Alan Sims. Just looked him yes, up. Yes, Alan Seemed like Sims. a nice I guy. Love then, that huh? guy. Sweet guy. Sweet guy. Thank yeah. you for looking that up. Wow. Well, you you made it work. I mean, you you totally you know, right. sold it. Sure. You sold it. <laughs> I'm good with the props. I mean, that was one thing I could, I was hiding behind the mask, but I could uh, you know, as an actor, I knew how to hit the tape mark and I knew how to cock my head and I knew how to play with the props. <laughs> I was good at that, you know. It all worked. It all worked. <laughs> God, yeah, it was pretty it was fun. Fantastic. And, you know, everybody was nice on that show. I mean, I knew you, you probably talked about this ad nauseum, but like everybody in that cast, like I didn't get the sense that even though Rick Berman, who, you know, we all know was the biggest ego in the in the in the on the lot, we we I didn't sense that uh, people were being uh, I didn't maybe I didn't know weren't being mistreated. Everyone felt uh, like a group, an ensemble. I, I saw you guys. Uh, backing each other up, you know, in scenes. And I saw everybody participating because you all felt like, you know, you were all the crew of the, of the, enter uh, the enterprise. So, you know, yeah. I, 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 I appreciated that and saw it. I don't know if that was the case, Denise, but that's yeah, how it absolutely. looked. Absolutely. I mean, everybody, you know? you know, we were, we were in the trenches, you know, that first season we, we, um, you know, we had to uh, really like, get watch each other's backs you know yeah. it was it was a it was wild um we weren't sure what was going on behind the scenes we weren't always privy to things we felt there was some tension uh with the, in the writer's room and and mm -hmm. um you know they kind of power powers that be i mean suits were coming down from paramount to you know keep an eye on us and and so we were they 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 tried to keep us in the dark a lot about stuff um i'm sure and yeah. you know we and and that was fine we just we just we just kept each other going and you know the hours were brutal i mean those those days were really long and um you know yeah. we had it was it was tough shooting that show it was not easy you but know? but john before we were uh, we we began recording you said something that i want to double back on and it was a really great compliment, but I, I just wanted for clarification because something I hadn't heard before. And you said outside of uh, Patrick Stewart, the biggest, you know, star on the show was who? Denise. It was true. She's the one when the cast came out and you saw who was in it. Denise yeah. is who everyone know who, who it was. I mean, oh, we all kind of knew Patrick because, you know, everyone knows the Brits. We love the Brits, but he, you know, yeah. she was our she was our name, really, to, yeah. to us actors. So, uh, yeah. So um, uh, that's I'm not kidding. That's the way it was. And at, at where I was and I'm you know, I was in there. I was in that game back then. I was yeah. John, I, I made a good living in the 80s going from show to show. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it was a time when you could do that. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So. Uh, not even close to being able to be the case these days. Maybe in the last 20 years, you can't even do it. So. Well, you certainly made a pretty big name for yourself. I mean, looking up all your credentials in the past, 
You've done quite a bit. Uh, you've done quite a bit in directing uh, currently as well. Before we get into directing, though, I just appeared for a quick second because I just remembered something from my childhood. And that thing I remembered was this. You yeah, are I was going to say, sir, you are going to bring that figure. out. <laughs> oh, wow. How, wow. So, I mean, that's got to be so cool to have your very own action figure. Yeah. Uh, yep. Denise does as well, so does Sirach, but that is oh, an iconic character cool. if you've got your own yeah. your own action figure. And that, and that is indeed the Mordok guy because yes. that's the outfit, that's the tunic. Exactly. They didn't, yep. I guess they didn't put the Mendon out, but look how giant that thing is, the the, the breathing device, look yeah. how giant it is. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't make yeah, it small it's enough, fruity. they couldn't get a mold small enough. But yeah, you know, I have one of those signed by Michael Westmore. I have it in, oh, the, cool. in a box. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, as Denise will attest, uh, we got we got nothing from that uh, action figure. <laughs> right. Let me ask you about that action figure uh, specifically. How long after your appearance did it uh, did the action figure materialize? I think it, it pretty soon because they were mm -hmm. they were full into merchandising. I, I believe it must have been the following year, if not that, you know, soon after. It was definitely after it aired. And, uh, you know, everyone, oh, I know, I know what, because when I went back season two to do that mm -hmm. other one, Michael Westmore pulled it off the shelf and said, you see this? You're an action figure. And then we, you know, <laughs> and, there, and that's how I, I knew about it. So it must have happened between the, between the two. And, uh, you oh, know, I used yeah. to see them on eBay and, uh, you know, cause I'm stealth. No one knows it's me because look at the makeup. You can't <laughs> yeah. tell. So I can, yeah. I can oh, gaslight people on. Oh, we can tell it was you me. in a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, those lips. Uh, I gaslight people online all the time with uh, on eBay, especially that are selling those. And, uh, you know, I, I usually uh, can say, hey, how come you don't have the one that's signed by Michael Westmore? You know, and they go, what? There's one that's signed by you. go, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wow. Well, let's be careful. Talk. People, people will be getting those signed at the convention. They'll be sending them like, yeah. Mr. That's Westmore, right. can you sign my Mordock, please? <laughs> oh, that's true. I sure so I'm pretty that. sure that I'm pretty sure there'll be one. Listen, and you the, tell, the, them, the tell number, them, no, the, I won't sign Mordock. I'll only sign Mendon. Mendon, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, you know, as an actor, when you've worked as many years as we have, you, you, you can track what are the most uh, aired shows you've ever done i don't know if you ever do that huh. you guys uh but no. like uh this show uh i get more fan mail from these two appearances on this show than anything i've ever done the other one second is jaws 3d because i was in that and then a distant third is uh seinfeld i did one episode of seinfeld oh, oh and i one? had like three lines with jerry and i'm, oh, I'm wow. it's on all the time there's always two dollars coming, uh, residual okay. or something. But this show, the <laughs> power of this franchise, forget about. It. I mean, people send me full-on glossies to sign and cards, and you know the little trading cards and the you know those action figures. It's wild, and I'm happy to sign them and send them off. You know, mm -hmm. but it's it's crazy how it just huge it is. It's yeah. it's it's um, and I'm so lucky to be a part of it because I got to do two of yours. And then I got to be in the Generations movie. I have stories about Shatner on that one. And then right. I got, and then years later, I'm where I get to work with Bob Picardo. He's he's been in several of my movies as a director, and uh, and I, I directed him in a play. And then I got to, I just finally got to work with John Johnny uh, Frakes this year in this Hallmark thing I did. I have Picardo and Frakes. In the same, oh, wow. in the same thing. Yeah, and we had a we had a we had What's a it called? love fest. It's called uh, a built more Christmas, and it'll be out oh. in out in you know Walmart. next. Well, yeah. excuse cool. me, hello. I know you've <laughs> done the, time. You, you've done <laughs> like a million of them, right? Not no, no, I've never done the Walmart thing. Oh well, we need to. We need to. We need, we need to, to, fix to I that. need to suggest you, you know. And, we need to, and it's got to be Christmas because it's you know, always Christmas. It's, it's got to be a Christmas movie. Oh because, yeah. You know, I can I can, so I, got some, love I got some street I can see you in a love story. Yeah. <laughs> I can see you in a nice love story. A nice Actually, homework love story. Yeah, there was one I almost did once where it was kind of cool because it was pretty progressive. It was um, you know. I was the mother of of a, a guy who's gay, and and it was the first time Hallmark was doing like a Christmas gay story. 
But yeah. I don't know what happened. It took yeah, that was a big deal. That was that was in the yeah. last couple of years, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So you have you've I, been down there. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'd like I'd love to work with you. That would be so you, much fun. It would be that fun. Would be, the, the trekking that, yeah. I know it's like it's I'm connected <laughs> in ways of six degree you know yeah so I, I'm very glad about that I'm very happy about to be included and, and be part of the history books it's fun because you know John just, you mentioned your yeah. your transition from being an actor to a director which you are currently and my question is and this is this may be a question you haven't gotten before but would you hire yourself, Ooh. the actor version of yourself, for a project uh, that you've directed? And if so, which project would that have been? Well, yes, I would, because <laughs> I appreciate the kind of actor I was. Show okay. up on time, know my lines, don't yeah. piss anybody off, work as yeah. an ensemble, not a star, mm, and, yep. and you know, hit hit my mark. I mean, that's... A director's dream and when i get actors like that on a, on my set as a director i'm literally a, i'm like oh my god thank you lord some somebody has sent a, a a good human being actor to me that's not in this for some other reason anyway yes mm -hmm. i would i would uh, put uh hire myself what project no idea because uh, i don't i don't <laughs> I don't. I, I'm not particularly uh, fond of looking at myself on camera. So <laughs> that's why, because I deleted my uh, my uh, picture here. I'm only seeing you three. So just uh, give me an idea. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, here you are yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, that I can take because I. You know, yeah. <laughs> now, John, we only have you for another minute or so, but you did. I know, but you did sneak quickly by saying that you have many stories about William Shatner. Oh, it's um, a whole episode. Well, you were it's on the episode. movie <laughs> Generations, right? You were one of the reporters yeah. on yeah. the bridge, which is yeah. such a fun scene. Everybody remembers that scene as the Tuesday <laughs> scene. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I'll give you the cliff note. Uh, it was uh, me and Tommy Hinckley, another actor, Oh, who, uh, who, who we were pals and we got cast Junie Larry Johnson sorry it, 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 Junie Larry Johnson said to the producers of the movie hey let's get everybody we loved from Next Generation's guest stars and see if they'll you know we can put them populate these little you know parts and that was the pitch when they called to ask would you ever do two days, uh, you know, as a reporter or would you ever, you know, they were very nice uh, about, you know, giving us the, making us feel good about ourselves. But, and, and because of that, I, I made a, I got in there uh, and Tommy got in there and I knew uh, Gwen Van Dam got in there and there are other people who had been in the show that apparently they liked over the years. Anyway, so that, that's how I that's got so in there. Fun. So the best part is though, it's, I'm, I'm the guy with the camera on my head and uh, Tommy is the audio guy. He's got the microphone. So I have the stupid appliance again <laughs> on my head. And, and the, pictures, the pictures are hysterical. And, and so and I'm on the bridge when they parade Kirk and, and uh, uh, Scotty and check Walter came and check off around. And uh, I got a couple of days with those guys. It might have been a whole week. And um, I loved those two guys and uh, Shatner, you know, was Shatner. And uh, but those two guys were great. I talked about, you know, I, I sat around, they sat with in the chairs with us. They were really cool. And uh, they they were not happy with Shatner because his book had just come out, you know, his tool book, basically, where he his his ego and his, he himself just alienated even more people. So everybody, uh, please were... welcome. William Shatner is here. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. But anyway, he was he was pretty funny and pompous. And I got to interact with him. And he he thought I was an extra and he never looked me in the eye. And he literally, I was, I had dialogue with him. And he didn't, he 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 kept looking at David Carson, the director, and saying, Is there any way we could possibly, you know, and I'm going, Bill, yeah. I'm here. I'm right, I'm right here. here. Tell tell me what you want oh, me to do. Wow. And and uh so there was a bit of that. And Can you ask him to move a little bit to the left, please? <laughs> yeah, I should have. 
I should have, but he threw me into a light. Uh, you know, he pushes me away. Get out of my face with that thing. You know, he pushes me into a light and I literally, I knocked over a light because he pushed me off this thing. You know, he didn't make me work. And so I like, literally I walked up to him and I said, look, we've done stage combat. Don't push me. I, I just knocked the light over. I literally say to him, I go, just, you know, give me the shove. I'll do the work. This is how we do it. And he literally looked at David Carson and said, I think we should do it again. And I will... I'll, you know, I won't what? push so hard this time. <laughs> so it, it was hilarious. It, it was a hilarious four days. And there's wow. more. There's more. Wow. There's so much more, but I can't, you know, you know, I know you don't want to talk about it, but because you know, this is the not that show, but uh, fun. <laughs> and I, every day I'd go home and I'd go, honey, guess what happened today? And I'd tell her the whole, because it's, it's Captain Kirk, you know? Yeah. Watching yeah. yeah. his childhood. And there he was. He was a really, it was a really fun yeah. experience. So anyway, I got to do that, and and that, and that, I think that was the end of it. Really. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't work on your show, Ciroc, and I didn't, uh, I didn't work on oh. Voyager. I knew people. I knew, mm -hmm. you know, we all knew each other then. You know, yeah. You go to well, you mentioned Junie, and I, I mean that yeah. Junie hired me for my role, and I love her dearly for that. Yeah. You'll never be able to thank her for that. Uh, repay her. Yeah, but no, uh, she was she was yeah. great to us. And David yeah. Carson directed our pilot episode, if I'm not mistaken. So I, uh, he definitely yeah. did. Yeah, that mm -hmm. sweet guy. Yeah, sweet guy. Really. And, I liked uh, him a lot. I thought a terrific director too. Yeah, yeah, and and I had that movie was John Alonzo was the DP, the mm, John wow. Alonzo, wow. and he had wow. you know. And what's weird is is there was one camera even on this feature. Nowadays, we're used to two or three cameras. Yeah, one camera. I can't imagine shooting one camera as a director. But uh, but he had his credits on a plaque on the Panavision, on the big camera. So, like, <laughs> there would be literally one, you know, those uh, plastic plates with the white uh, perfect lettering engraving on it. And it would have Ooh. all of his movies. You know, oh, and, oh, and, 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 you know, and he he had his little hat on and everything. And, and I loved him because... He would be standing around in the middle of a set like this and people are setting up and time would go by, time would go by and we're sitting there waiting to start. And he literally would shout at the top of his lungs, are we going to shoot this or admire it? And I never <laughs> forgot that. <laughs> and I say it, I say it to this day when I'm what waiting, when I'm waiting on something on set and because I want to go fast as a director and uh, and uh, I'm standing around. I'll say that once in a while. That no one knows what they think of. Who's the asshole? No, no. You know, <laughs> right. Do you do right. you do you use that voice though when you do it though? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes because no one knows what I'm doing, or they may yeah. think he's. They may think I'm kidding. I I really because uh, uh, I thought it was Sean Connery. That sounded a lot like Sean to me. <laughs> no, this was John Alonzo. Well, oh, oh did, okay. did I put the accent in there? Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Sorry, Sean Connery in there. Well, you know what Sean Connery said when the book fall, fell on his head, right? I blame no. myself. So, uh, <laughs> oh god. Anyway, the point is, oh, Sean. This, sorry, Denise. This has <laughs> oh, been so much fun. My heart, be still, my heart. <laughs> we really appreciate yeah. you joining us. You absolutely are the guest by far that looks the most like a football coach that we've ever had, and I love every <laughs> minute of it. And we, I am we an really NFL fan. And I'm an NFL fan. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I know you don't have repeats, but if you need me for matter of honor, just let me know. I can continue the story. We would love that. Oh, we'd love to hear the Mendon, rest of those stories. Because there's a lot of Do there are it. a lot of questions uh that we're gonna have about Mendon. Yeah. Um, but we you know I, shouldn't ask yeah. him now. So we'd love to have you. Thank you so much. I got much. more, I got more trivia. Uh we didn't touch on any of that. You're very good with your timing. Thank you. Uh, I would stay longer, for but the jokes. I, I understand. Yeah, no, I like the jokes. <laughs> uh, all right, well, look, you it, know, it's great it was a to pleasure, know you. Pleasure to meet you, John. So you good awesome. to see you again. Been way, Bye, Denise. way too yeah. long. I way know. Well, long. thanks and, again. John, before you go, movie. before you go, everybody at home, check out the Hallmark movie. What, what was it called again? It's called A Built More Christmas. And, and uh, the one with Denise in... Crosby will be the following year, everybody. <laughs> let us hope. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so everybody stick around. We will be right back. Uh, thank you so much to John. This has been amazing. Really appreciate you and your time. We'll be right back, everybody, on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Denise Crosby and Sirach Lofton. Uh, that smile we have is 
from John Putch. <laughs> he was so much fun. Even after he left, yeah. we were like, oh my God, he was so much fun. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we love him. We hope to have him back again sometime. It would be amazing. Uh, very quickly, here are the trivioids of the week. Wesley Crusher has a friend named Jake. It was just so cool to hear him say, Jake. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Admiral Gregory Quinn is on Relva 7 and has requested to be beamed aboard the Enterprise immediately. Wesley Crusher will be 16 next month. Mordock constructed the Mordock strategy. <laughs> Only fools okay. have no fear. Admiral Quinn wants to promote Picard to Admiral to take over as Commandant of Starfleet Academy. There's something wrong in the environmental lab and Picard decides he's going for a walk. So this was a lot of fun, this episode. Um, it was kind of a Wesley Crusher episode that kind of befit a Wesley Crusher episode. It seems like they're maybe ironing that out a little bit more. What do you guys think? Yeah, it was nice to see uh, Wesley with, you know, kids with his, his own age, his peers. Again, mm -hmm. we're seeing how that really benefits um the the show really really blossoms for him when that happens and it, it it whenever this is now like i think the second or third episode we've seen where he's you know with his with his peers and just how appropriate it it feels and such a nice addition and he was just delightful uh, in this in this episode, and I, I really liked this episode. I I didn't remember it as usual. <laughs> <laughs> there, people, our audience is going to say, you know, I really think she needs to see someone. <laughs> well, I challenge anybody to remember something thirty six years ago. <laughs> Come it on, just you know, I mean, yeah. really, I can't. But um, it was it was just really um, it was it was just a fun engaging episode and they blended the two a and b stories were a little more you know symbiotic in in this way than they sometimes are Mordor. yeah Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i thought this could have been episode could have been called the test because mm -hmm. it felt like both picard was getting put through a test mm. the ship the, the oh, state you know the whole right. ship was being yeah. tested and wesley's being tested so mm -hmm. like I feel like everybody was being tested. Um, the first about ten to twelve minutes, I was I was a little slow on, so it took me a while to get into the story. Um, it just didn't unfold fast enough for me. But once I got into it and it started rolling, it past the around twelve minute mark. I felt. Um, that I like the story more and more because um, the, um, the commander Remick yeah. who was going around being, you know, uh, his own captain Shaw <laughs> in his own mind. Get it. In, <laughs> yeah, in his own mind, he was captain Shaw and just getting under people's skin and just, you know, um, I, I thought he, he really was good. Um, Cause there yeah. was a, there was a moment where I was questioning his motives. I didn't know if there was something else going on. It was hard. He was getting under people's skin really well. Um, I like the fact that the crew sticked, you know, were sticking together. I like that they were like, no, we're not, there's nothing to see here. And we're not going to talk about anything that we have going on personally that we've, you know, personal discussions. Um, for example, when Dr. Crusher came in and said, you know, what how i feel my opinion of of the captain is none of your business or something to that effect yeah she did yeah so i thought that was good um mm -hmm. i also liked the way everybody was you know even data um you know st stood up and he was like there's nothing you know there's nothing there there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. and yeah he did have one quick line he said uh when remix he data says there's nothing wrong with captain picard and remix says that is not acceptable. And Data says, acceptable or not, sir, it is the truth. And we're all mm -hmm. like, whoops, checkmate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I like that everybody was sticking up for their captain and for their ship. And mm -hmm. um, to me, that that's what this, this episode really brought out the most. Um, 
And the uh, the other thing that I really enjoyed was the scene between Worf and Wesley. It was it felt like I got the most mm-hmm. of like we don't really get much Worf so far, mm-hmm. and I really got a window into Worf's kind of thinking. Um, I thought him having the interaction with Wesley and being concerned about him was also another good sign of uh, you know fellow you know human being concerned about another one. Um, and also Worf opening up and giving him some personal like yeah. advice about his own insecurities. I thought, whoa, that's pretty uh, yeah. mature. I was wondering Worf. if maybe they were thinking, let's plant the seeds of this unlikely friendship of a Wesley and Worf friendship. And then I thought about it. And I, I don't remember anything ever coming from that in subsequent episodes, but I wonder because it felt like they were trying to create a little, a little thing there. And it, and it seemed like it would have been a really fun and interesting storyline to follow for years to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Worf gave a great line. He said, thinking about what you can't control only wastes energy and creates its own enemy. It was a great, Mm -hmm. uh, Kind of a you know like a fatherly or big brotherly advice to give to Wesley, and then he went on to say you know only fools have no fear. Another mm-hmm. kind of just insight into Worf, who has this very tough exterior, but admitting that mm-hmm. you know there is something that he's fearful of, and I that just that kind of moment of bonding I think is essential to character building when you're doing these kinds of shows. It makes us believe that everybody cares about each other and that they spend so much time together in the same place. So, you know, that if you spend time with somebody in a long enough, you know, in a closed environment, you just friendships and relationships are going to begin yeah. to form. And I, it's just only natural. So I, I love that kind of seeing those things unfold. And it's, it's, it's smart, you know, writing it's, it's, it's deep thinking, you know, that, that went into this and you get a, a sense of the depth of these people that they're not just uh, without, without conscience and, and, and thought and, and depth reading that they, they spent time in with philosophers and, 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 and structuring, you know, these, these philosophies that start to come through. It's not just reacting to, you know, crises and things like that, but they, they actually, they actually have, you know, philosophical points of view that come out that that's nice to see. You know, and the, you know, the other, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please. Please. I was going to change the subject onto something else. Uh, Me too, to some degree, but I, you know, the the, the topic I was going to bring up is that, this episode actually was referring to other episodes. So that's when, what I was. Uh, com- that's oh, what were I was you about to say? To say I was like, at, at a certain uh, point, it started to feel like yeah. to me like a writer strike episode, like a clip show. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, was there a writer strike going on in in uh in early? Wow. Yeah, but I thought it was unusual yeah. for for eighteen episodes in for a guy like Commander Remick to be able to go through and ask about previous episodes and say, well, mm. what about the Ferengi? What about the Ferengi thing that happened? What about the, uh, you Ito. know, that time? Yeah. yeah when you yeah. guys ran into that. Yes, exactly. When, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the guy and took the ship to the end of space or whatever it was that, that episode. Um, so they were referring to their own episodes, another kind of, uh, weird thing to do so early on in the show right it's it's the first season you're just getting your legs under you right as a show and here you are two-thirds of the way through and you're like already doing a flashback or or referencing three or four different episodes that have Mm -hmm. already occurred Mm -hmm. Uh, and i thought that's kind of unusual um just felt like unusual to me not that it's never been done before i don't know i just i just never i just don't recall it that much you know watching shows mm-hmm. um but i give them credit for um consistency and keeping keeping the audience reminded about the things that we've yeah. seen already so that yeah. was a good thing for them mm-hmm. um but i also want to say that captain picard you know uh 
gives really good deliveries at certain moments that I really think he's exceptional at. And mm -hmm. some of those moments are when he's stern. And I like when uh, Patrick is stern, giving direct, um, saying directly how he feels. Um, he's not, you know, he's a little bit different with the playful stuff, but with the stern straight ahead stuff, he's pretty solid. And mm -hmm. um, my moment is when he was talking to uh, the commander Remick on the bridge of the ship who was in the interfering with them as they were going through this very kind of critical moment with the kid Jay could took the runabout. And as they were going through that uh, thing, Commander Remick runs in and says, hey, you know, you got to do this or whatever. It's very dangerous. And, and Captain Picard says, either get out of my way and keep quiet or I'll have you removed from the bridge. And it was a very, you know, it was no nonsense. Mm. And, I, and I really like it when uh, Patrick Stewart goes no nonsense. I like it when um, Avery Brooks goes no nonsense. I think it's there's just a moment. To me, that's what a captain is. It's the guy who's willing to and not afraid to say things that might hurt your feelings, but they got it has to be said. And to in order to remain or you know re, reclaim order, and um, mm -hmm. that's to me those are the moments. Those are the captain moments. I want to see the captain say no. This is how it's going to be. I'm drawing a line here, and and you know and and setting a tone. And I thought that Picard did a very good job of setting that tone in that moment. Like, you know, you might have your job to do, but this is my ship. I got a job mm -hmm. to do. And you're interfering, and so, you know, there's no there's no middle ground here. You see, when you said up, that, Sirak, I was picturing Denise as a captain. I was like, oh man, she could nail that role like that <laughs> yeah. too. I can yeah. just see it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, and you never, you never, um, he never loses command. You know, of this, he really sets. That and I, I remember acting with him uh, on the show. There, there was always that he brought that personally to the set. You know, there was a there was a gravitas. There was a there was a seriousness. There was a um, preparedness. You know, you never like you never thought Patrick was going to show up not knowing his lines and not giving. You know, I, I mean nor did any that happen with anyone but you you got the sense that you know this man is like we've got to fall in line hmm. alongside acting with him you know so it was never you never had to do this like leap of faith to to believe he was your captain he just brings that personally yeah. you know yes yeah well that's it's what i'm talking for about our uh home run of mm. the episode uh today uh denise you're already smiling i hope that means you've got one well, already or you know i i go back and forth with this one i mean i between wesley and picard you know for me in this one um i thought will had an exceptional um episode in yeah. that he really had to had to have some a lot of different places he had to go to in this episode. Um, I mean, I think I got to give him a tie because I I just think Patrick too was was superb in this in this particular episode where he really um, you 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 feel him struggling with the, the 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 position he finds himself in that is so is 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 so uncomfortable for him to be kind of not brought in, you know not in on the assignment here it's his ship it's his power it's his you know he knows it better than anyone he's one of the great captains and yet he's not being allowed in on this and he just does such a magnificent job, I think, in this particular episode. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a tie. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to give first my honorary mention to uh, Jonathan Frakes, who does some of the best pouting I've ever seen uh, <laughs> as an actor. <laughs> When he throws his tantrum, uh, temper tantrum, yeah, he's like, he just, I don't want to be here. And he just does this thing. And it's funny because he did that when, um, you know, Troy's husband popped out of nowhere or arranged marriage husband guy. And he went on his whole like, I done just really upset and you've just pissed me off. So uh, I love <laughs> when he does his temp temper tantrum. I think Jonathan Frakes is hilarious at the temper tantrum. I love it. Um, but my my home run is actually going to go to John Putch. Mm-hmm. Is that is how you pronounce his last name? Putch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I liked what he did with the character. I guess some of it can go to the writing, but I want to also say the delivery. Um, and the moment that I'm giving it to him for was. I think it's something very admirable when somebody forfeits their own uh, reward or, um, you know, he was being praised for being exceptional at what he does. And instead of uh, accepting that praise and saying, you know, yes, I'm the best, he actually took that opportunity to say, no, Wesley, I wouldn't have done it without Wesley. He took time out. He helped me. And he was basically saying Wesley's better than me. And I actually thought that's, that is a quality in itself, Mm. which makes, which makes him worthy of being chosen because it's a level of honesty that requires you to take yourself down a notch. Mm-hmm. And he could have easily have just accepted the praise and been put on the pedestal, but he actually had to reflect and be honest with himself and mm-hmm. um, and pass the proper uh, due acknowledgement to what Wesley did. And I thought that is what made him worthy of being the first Benzite in uh, Starfleet, that mm-hmm. quality. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got so much to add to all this, but I'm going to try to trim it very as well as uh, Wesley Crusher's hair got trimmed. Uh, I feel like Wesley <laughs> Crusher's barber gets an honorable mention. I feel like Riker doing his straddling over the seat gets oh, honorable yeah. mention. You know, it's like yeah. he thinks he's on a on a horse or something. Uh, mm-hmm. Wesley Crusher himself. Uh, it's nice to see him doing things that befit the character. I think a little bit better, and he did very well with that. Um, and, but John Putch, to me, for introducing one of my favorite aliens, which are the Benzites. Mm. I love the Benzites, even though we don't get to see much of them. And I think somebody might look to possibly overact in a case like that because you're an alien, you know, this character actor, you know, territory covered from head to toe. But the script didn't really call for the need to overact, you know, and so I think. He did a great job of playing it just ever so slightly, a little bit different, a little bit alien without trying too hard to create something, you know, zany. Um, So definitely home run of the day for him, but also honorable mention to Picard's side eye when Remick said, I get off in six months. I'd love to be part of the Enterprise. And Picard's like, (laughs) are you? That was the most British side eye I've ever seen. I was like, woo. Oh, yeah. If looks could kill, that guy would have a sprained finger right now. I know. Is it, is this may be the first time, too, we're really seeing the Picard maneuver, the yeah. pulling down of the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Doing it quite a bit in this Very line. nice. Yeah, Picard yeah. maneuver, the Riker maneuver, yeah. the, you know, when he straddles. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so yeah. uh, very quickly, let's give a very special thanks to our friends, Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Uh, Titus Muller, the Kings fan, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, uh, Neil Akasaka, Saka. our good friend Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, 
the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Jed Thompson, Steve Case. Is that Joe Bugbuster? Yep. And of course, <laughs> Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. Thank you very much, everybody. Stick around. We've got the free for all up next. It's going to be fun as heck. Watch your mouth. We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the seventh rule. This is the free for all. Of course, we've got Allison Leach Hyde joining us. Uh, Faith Howell is here, as is Jason Oaken. We've got Dr. Muhammad Noor here, and Eve England is not here. She's out in Wales, but she's present. Uh, Steve Case is also here. Mai is live in New York. Carrie Schwent is live in Chicago. And uh, Chris McGee is going to swallow our souls tonight. Uh, the Dark Lord. <laughs> Homer Frizzell is also here wearing a radical self-sealing stem bolt seventh rule shirt that you could get at our uh, Teespring store in the comments below. Sorry, in the description box below. Sorok's wearing his incognito too. Don't think I didn't notice. Really gorgeous. All right. Yeah. So. Hey, hey don't forget Muhammad Noor. Did I forget Dr. Okay. Muhammad? No, you got me. You got me. Oh. It's all good. But, but uh, thank you, Sorak. I appreciate you coming out for me. All right. Make it short. Double uh, mention. Uh, the man so nice, we named him twice. All right. <laughs> so let's see. Did we have any non-appearance mentions today? Um, yes. We have one by my count. And his name is Jack Crusher. They mentioned Beverly Crusher's husband. Also, one huge thing we didn't mention uh, earlier, when he ran, when Wesley Crusher ran into Rondon, I am Rondon, you despicable melanoid slime worm. Mm. Does anybody know why that is important? Yes. That is what Murph is in Star Trek Prodigy, right? He is a melanoid slime worm. Something that was mentioned only uh, once in Star Trek history before Prodigy, oh, wow. and it was that one very line. That's why nobody could guess it before wow. when we were trying to figure out what Murph is. So Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Um hmm, hmm. Uh, I'm gonna go with a seven. Solid seven. All right. Anybody else have any guesses that doesn't already know? 6.2. Seven I'm thinking good. closer to an 8. Ooh. I really oh. like this episode. 7.3? <laughs> These are excellent Three. guesses. All right. The answer is 7.1. Oh, go Sorak. Wow. This guy, Sorak, he's too good at this. He's on it. <laughs> All so right. Bad. So let's talk about this fun episode. Uh, Eve England sipping in her futuristic mug. Can you please start us off? Actually, I remember those mugs kind of started in like the 80s for like travel mugs or something, right? Okay, they don't spill. So they're, they're quite handy. <laughs> what do you think yeah. of this one? Yeah, I like this one. I didn't kind of feel myself rolling my eyes really very much at all, which is really positive for me. So yeah, no, I actually really enjoyed it. And I I like I like the Wesley story particularly. I thought it was really nice to see more from Wesley and to see him with other characters as his own age. And I thought that came across really well. Um but I I really I did like the the, the fact at the end that the you know the admiral had this big conspiracy theory so i was kind of i want to hear more about that so i'm i'm hoping that we might get more of of this in the future but i'm assuming that maybe we don't and that was just kind of a plot device for this episode but i was quite intrigued by what potential sort of infiltration they might have had at the top of, of the federation and starfleet so yeah I, I was kind of intrigued by that so i was a bit disappointed that there wasn't more of that so I'm, I'm fingers crossed I get more, but I'm not 100% convinced I'm going to get that. Hmm. What's hmm. funny about that is uh, Denise, Sorok, and Eve here are the only ones that haven't seen these episodes before. So we didn't talk about this earlier, but when you said 
I, I forgot about that, that they mentioned this conspiracy thing and they just mm. didn't touch it at all after that. So yeah. uh, I'm sure everybody else here has no idea if the conspiracy plot line will continue on towards the end of this season or any other. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Noor, your thoughts on this episode? Uh, they're, they're a little spoilery, but I'd say I like both plots. Um, I was excited to see the introduction of both Remick and Admiral Quinn, just because they're characters that we may get to know a little bit more later on. <laughs> so that was that was interesting. Um, I actually thought Remick had some interesting depth and complexity to him. So even if he was annoying to the crew, I actually found him an interesting character nonetheless. Um, on the Starfleet exam front, I like that plot okay. I wish there was a little bit more depth to Oleana Mirren. I mean, not just like, you know, a little bit of a stereotype of insecure and commenting. Wesley's cute. Like, okay. <laughs> but the plot was interesting and the performances were compelling. So overall, I was, I was pretty positive. Actually, I, I concur with even that this was one of the better, uh, one of the better episodes, relatively speaking, across the, across the season. And, you know, and quite good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason Oaken, what do you think? Quite good or nah? I, it's, it's one of the more, uh, I, I'd say unique episodes of the first season so far. Uh, to some degree, it's focused more on character, I think, than some of the others were. Certainly the Wesley story, you know, you, you can argue with the execution and the detail whether something should have been a little bit more in depth. But at least, you know, they tried to, to go after sort of the, the character story more than the plot itself. I mean, you know, the plot piece is, you know, is the conspiracy piece. And to me, it's all, you know, this episode has always been sort of a, uh, I guess, a, a companion to something else, which we don't want to spoil. And that, that's how I tend to see the show specifically. But, you know, the Wesley story, just to see, first of all, to see him, you know, basically fail at something, even though, mm-hmm. you know, he tried hard enough and failed. And I think it's maybe, you know, it's certainly the first time we see him fail. Exactly. Uh, not the last time, but certainly the first time. And it's nice to see that he was not perfect. And the fact that, you know, he certainly didn't accomplish what he wanted to. If he did, he'd be off the show. Uh, just like, you know, Riker gets his command and he's off the ship. So it's, you know, obviously it was not going to happen. Certainly not, you know, in 1980s television. Uh, but but it was certainly good to see, uh, you know, they tried to work some humor in. And, you know, uh, I mean, obviously when, you know, Remick was interviewing, you know, the Enterprise crew members, it was interesting there was a lot of sort of tension there with starkly personnel which is a little bit different from that roddenberry box there was a lot more conflict here at least with remick coming in than you usually see uh within starfleet so it, it was kind of refreshing a little bit different uh you know one thing i did notice was you know he certainly talks to a few crew members and you know we're talking about you know potential conspiracy security and you'd think he may want to have a, a word with tasha yeah there uh, <laughs> maybe <You think? laughs> But then, yeah, you know, we get Worf saying, you know, you, know, do, you don't like me, do you? Is that required? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's funny. It, it plays funny. Uh, but I, I think in terms of the story, you know, probably makes more sense to have that interview. So we all pretend it happened off screen. Mm-hmm. But it would have been nice to see yeah. uh, that happen. I mean, I, I don't know what, what the thinking, you know, other than, you know, making it humorous. Whether this, you know, there, there was thing, you know, any thinking behind it, or you know, Denise, was there anything cut there? I mean, was was a film cut? I mean, it doesn't seem like it. I mean, it seemed like that's no, what they intended. I don't, I don't recall that. You know, I, it being cut, or you know, I get, I'm the only one that you know gets cut, or I, I, I don't think it went that way. Um, I think they wanted. You know, they were always trying to figure this this out still in this in this first season. What does Worf do? What does Tasha do? What did you know, we've got two of two of them in this kind of position. So it's like trying to give, you know, everybody a a, a fair fair shake here. So um, but I guess that you know, this time was was Worf's time to, you know, be featured. <laughs> That's all I can I can think about with with this stuff. It, it, you know, we've we've seen together a lot of times. I'm I'm in watching these again after all this time. Going, what? Where's the chief of security? You know what? It's it's head scratching at times. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I think that that I, this is again this is what I was going through while doing the show. I was scratching my head, going, what am I doing here? 
yeah. we're getting a we're getting a kind of confirmation of it all you know mm-hmm. oh i maybe i wasn't crazy for leaving the show you know yeah mm-hmm. yeah what is that line from ghostbusters i don't think you're crazy <laughs> uh oh thank you that makes me feel so much better i think is what right. she replies to that um good stuff thank you very much allison leach hyde is here wearing the cisco kid created by Sorok's sister uh great color there what do you think of this episode i like the episode i wish it would have been a two-parter because there was a lot going on and it would have been nicer to have more every all the scenes fleshed out a little bit more because they had a lot of good ideas that could have been given more time and i think that would have been nice because we had three fairly meaty plots i guess for what we're used to for this first season and giving it more room to grow and breathe would have been nice uh some great lines i loved data um acceptable but or not sir it is the truth that's like one of my favorites love that there was a lot of yelling too, which was interesting. <laughs> Lots of raised voices for, you know, well-trained military-esque officers. So that was interesting choices for me. But I love this stuff with Wesley because he is a kid who gets to fail and have friends and be normal, which is great. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, that's. I wanted more Tasha, of course, but I sound like a broken record. I say that pretty much every episode that you're in. So if I would have taken more of actually all the ladies. And we had a lot of set dressing with just a couple of lines. Like Beverly didn't get to say goodbye or good luck to Wesley going down to take his test. She just gave him a hug. Pretty sure a mom would say some words. At least I would. So you know, signs of the times, but I enjoyed the episode overall. That would have been really interesting if we had, because there needs to be a reason for the scene, but the reason is kind of built in. What if she gives him some words of advice that play out later on in the episode that that's the reason he says, no, you know, uh, more doc, let me help you out. You know, if she, she gives him some kind of piece of advice that, that leads into that, that would have been really cool. All right. Speaking of really cool, the Dark Lord, Chris McGee is here. What's up, Chris? What did you think of this episode? I think it was a great episode. It was definitely uh, kind of a landmark episode, especially because of Wesley's entrance uh, to the or supposed interest to the Academy. I do have have a couple of interesting interesting observations about it, though. Uh, So apparently they only allowed one entrant this year. Is that each year? Uh, Seems like because they said, hope to see you back next year. You'll do better next year and so forth. So they're going to have the same test to allow only one person in. So I'm a little bit Curious about that. Apparently, uh, Starfleet Academy is much smaller than I thought it was. Um, and of course, as Eve had uh, mentioned, you know, when speaking of a threat to the Federation, what Eve and Sorok and anyone else who hasn't seen this series uh, in its entirety need to remember, this is a very much a an episodic show. So you can't really trust that there's ever going to be any callbacks or follow ups. So just bear that in mind. Um, and uh, finally, the little exchange near the end with uh, Picard and, and Curlin, when Picard says, I, I hope you've learned that running away solves nothing. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I th- don't, don't think this is the last time that TNG becomes an after school <laughs> special. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and then, of course, my phrase of the episode uh, Zoldans have webbed fingers. <laughs> Did anybody rewind and go back? to see if we saw his hands because I wanted to, but I didn't end up doing oh. it. Yes. He did. I when he puts his, his hand, hand up to his chest between yeah. his you could see it. thumb okay. and forefinger. Yep. That's mm-hmm. cool. Ah. All right. Cool. Carrie Schwent is hanging out in Chicago. She's got a really cool background. What's up, Carrie? what do you think about this episode? I like this episode. I'd forgotten how early in the, in the series it was. Of course, any episode that features my Wesley, I am 100% here for. He shows just some great maturity overall in the episode. I wanted the scene with Rondon in the hallway with the 
painted <laughs> fake hallway behind them just a little bit longer because that was just hysterical. I love, he has two really great scenes. The scene with Worf in the holodeck, they're kind of heart, heart to heart. Worf's quote definitely sp- speaks to me. Thinking about what you can't control only wastes energy and creates its own enemy. I definitely fallen prey to that more more than a, more than a few times. Yeah, the the scene with the two of them was just fantastic. Him just talking as 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 equals really, and the scene at the end with him him and Picard talk him you know giving 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 over the secret that he failed his first time too. I understand that very much myself. I failed my driver's test the first time, and it was probably a good three years before I finally got it. One of the only good things my exes ever did was drove me to the DMV, made me get my permit, made me drive everywhere, and then I finally got finally got my license. But yeah, I will. Yeah, Remicus was super creepy. I did enjoy his little yeah, getting in the spirit of things with on on the on the bridge with everybody. But then he went back to being creepy again. But I will end with my my limerick for for the for the episode. It is testing time for two of our crew. Picard learns his ship is up for review. Wesley faces his fears, but but must retest next year. And the admiral's offer Jean Luc won't pursue. Nice. Mm-hmm. There we have. Wow, great stuff, Carrie. Thank you very much for calling in all the way from Chicago. Mai is live in Tokyo slash New York. How are you, Mai? What did you think of this one? I loved seeing Sam. It was fantastic. Uh, and nobody watched Quincy when you were kids? Oh, Down Under? Oh, oh. No, that's Quigley. <laughs> Quincy. <laughs> Quincy. Quincy's assistant, Sam, was the guy that... that, that um, was the guy from Starfleet. So that was kind of cool. Um, I was, I found it curious how the crew got so annoyed at, at, at Remix so quickly rather than just making fun of me. Be like, you know, tell me this. What did you do there? I don't know. What did I do? Or something, you know, it'd be really smart ass you of them, but it would have been fun. Um, but that, maybe that's just me. <laughs> that would be all of it. <laughs> I noticed that Picard, He's he's always described as somebody who hates kids. He did phenomenally well with kids this time. Maybe it's better. Maybe he's better with adult kids. But he killed it with both with Wesley um, and Jake. I thought that was really fantastic the way he handled that. Um, a lot of subplots uh, going on this episode felt very short. It just zipped right by. I thought um, I like it a lot. It's a great episode. More about getting into Starfleet and getting getting an assist, getting to Starfleet. That really makes me happy. One thing I found weird about this is they didn't do their uh, science consulting with Doctor Mohammed Noor. They should have because you don't want to turn off liquid hydrogen if you want to prevent an explosion. You want to suck the oxygen out of the room because they already had nice. sparks, <laughs> some oxygen. Mm. They should have just sucked the oxygen out and there would have been no problem, but they're like, oh, we're going to have to, we can't shut it off. Who cares if you can shut it off? Just don't put oxygen in the room. But anyway, that was my thing. It was a great episode. Loved it. Excellent knowledge. You got like 14 thumbs up from Muhammad there. So that's, that's really good stuff. Uh, 16. All right. Uh, mm-hmm. Steve Case is also here. What's up, Steve? Did you enjoy uh, this episode? And uh, what can you teach us about science today? I did enjoy it, and uh, I agree that in, instead of just a major plot and a subplot or two, it had definitely um, two major plots, and they could have done more with it. Um, they almost could have each been their own plots, I thought. Um, when when the Admiral arrived, um, I noticed that the captain introduced um, – introduced him to Natasha Yar. And I thought, did I hear that right? Oh, yeah. 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 It I don't remember uh her name ever pronounced like that before. Um that Denise that's, would remember that. <laughs> yeah, that's her actual name. Um mm-hmm. but no one ever calls her Natasha in the show. <laughs> that that I I that may be the one and only time. Mm-hmm. Uh I don't I don't recall I, I noticed that too, but like, you know, like on my character description in the, in the Bible and in the, you know, playing cards and whatever, it's Natasha Yar. Okay. 
Well, I thought maybe being called a different name is why you disappeared mostly for the rest of the episode. And, um, <laughs> in, in the Inquisition. Out. Right. I went to my quarters and just said, in a huff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's just yeah. what he called you when you, he was mad at he you. Me Natasha. Natasha Yar. Yeah, oh totally. shit, I'm in trouble. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the um interrogations reminded me of like film I've seen of the um McCarthy hearings. Um and some of the <laughs> questions bordered bordered on um, you know, have you stopped beating your wife? It was just that kind of thing, like there was no good answer to it. Um we heard about Jack twice. Um, about how decisions, uh, Picard's decisions had led to his death. Um, Counselor Troy was interviewed, but her um, Betazoid powers never kicked in to realize what deception was going on. Yeah, so that was mm. a curious omission. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also realized that misappropriating a shuttle is a staple across all of the different Trek worlds. Um, we saw it in this episode. We saw it, I think, in, in every different Trek, probably more than once. So that was kind of curious. Um, a different, well, an alternative title came to mind, actually, when I was finished watching it, um, especially after um, Wesley's part. I thought this one could have been called um, Nice Guys Finish Last. Um, mm -hmm. cause if he had continued to be nice to the, um, Zaldan crewman, then he could have gotten beat up if he hadn't realized what he was and that he needed to be rude to him. Um, and if he'd been more forward to Oleana, um, then who knows what could have happened there. And of course, if he hadn't helped Mordak, then he might've received that one Star Trek, uh, that one Starfleet academy slot which yeah that struck me as odd too like there's only one opening every year that and these exact no same sense. people are going to come back every year and try again for that one slot so that didn't make any sense to me at all but i really did like the episode and yeah i'd give it an eight. Ooh, high praise yeah. well you know what always makes sense is listening to homer freezy out somewhere in new yeezy what's up homer uh did you watch this episode? And if so, did you enjoy it? Yes, on both counts. Uh, so it, it did strike me as odd that there was just the one slot as well. I got the impression that it wasn't overall, but it was just for that particular testing site. And I thought that at the beginning, the guy that stole the shuttle lost out to Wesley. So he couldn't go to this. And I thought they did a really good job of taking that part and then looping it in so that it's part of the A plot um, and the B plot. So they all sort of came together. So I thought they did a good job there. Uh, the interview scenes, I like the the cutting, the editing of them together. Uh, I thought that was well done. I mean, we've seen stuff like that before in court cases, but I thought it was done well. And then another thing that I noticed, of course we have, you probably mentioned the Riker maneuver, but we also have this moment where Riker comes in to talk to Picard. Picard's in the window. It's like he's contemplating his future. And we see Riker's reflection there for a bit. And I thought that was just some really nice camera work. Mm -hmm. Okay, now on to the big question. From the mind that brought you the question about the turbo deck, uh, sorry, the turbo lift, I want to know, is there direction that's given at the end of a scene, are you supposed to hold and have this dramatic pause like a soap opera? What's what's the direct what directions are given? Oh no! You, when the scene is over, the the director will yell cut. I mean, so, there's no. It's not like that soap opera thing. That is so weird. You know where you're you're yeah. holding. Um, um, no, it's they they the script supervisor is there. They've got you know they're. They're going along with you. They know what the last line is and, you know, the director will call it. Because I, I, it seemed to me towards the beginning, Riker is holding it for a little bit for, mm -hmm. for, and then they cut to what would have been a commercial there. Well, they so might, just... they, yeah, they might want to just, you know, hold a, a close up on him yeah. or something. 
but but you'll see start to watch it with that in mind you'll you'll start yeah. to watch the scenes and they 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 end pretty much when they you know when there's a commercial break it's sometimes a little bit different maybe yeah. or they're they're doing something a little bit more sustained but um yeah it's it's it all tv except soap operas you yeah. know are, they, they gotcha. yell at, you know, at the end so of the it season. wasn't it wasn't something, okay, Frakes, this time you're going to hold it for three seconds at the end and then we'll edit. All right. No, they, so, they would just, they, you know, they just probably stayed on his face a little bit yeah. longer and then went cut. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So that's another thing I can, I can put to bed and I can sleep better. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so well, glad. Well, you know, at the end of this free for all, we're all going to do that. Mental health, Homer. Yes. Very important. <laughs> Uh, Faith Howell is here, and we're so happy for it. She's on the bridge of the Enterprise D. What's up, Faith? What'd you think of this episode? The best Enterprise, right? Um, yeah, I, I like this one. Um, I, you know, I'm coming from the age where I really liked Wesley. I know, you know, he's not always everybody's favorite, but he was, you know, my big brother type hero. I, I think he's cool. Um, so I really enjoyed the idea of this test and um i've often wondered you know how how would i do on this test and what would my um big you know final exam test be um i wonder i, I wonder what you guys would pick if you had one maybe we could talk about that later um but yeah i i mainly agree with carrie um remix a creeper wesley's awesome um I, uh, and I also wanted to answer um, Mai's comment about Picard and, and the children. And I wonder if he did better with Wesley in this case, because um, now they have a point of similar lived experience. And so it, you know, he had something to speak to where, you know, a little toddler, you know, what do I do with it? It's, you know, drools, it, it runs around, it touches things. There's no rules in its little life that make sense to me. So what do I do? And so I know I know a lot of adults as a second grade teacher. I know a lot of adults are like that. They just don't know what to do with children. So um, I wonder maybe since they had this common experience, then he was able to have a really prolific conversation. Good point. Great stuff. Well, mm -hmm. um, it is time for oh, in honor of uh, Jerry Springer, I think that passed away recently. It's time for Ciroc and Denise's final thoughts on the episode. Oh God, with Jerry Springer, isn't that what he would do? Um, like a final thought yeah, or something like no, that? Well, or you know, stay tuned for next week where you know my Klingon baby is having an affair <laughs> with my giraffe, you know, or something. Um, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I liked this episode. Um, I, I really, again, you, you see when, when Wesley is with his peers, just how he can, he can really blossom. And it's just, it's just, it's just a whole different level of, of, of this character comes into, comes into play. I thought the guy, I thought, I really liked the guy who played um, their, their, uh, their leader, their supervisor through all the mm. testing. I thought he did a really nice job. Um, and Hack there was Officer one thing, Chang. Yeah, Officer Chang. I thought he was terrific. Um, the other thing is, um, there's interesting thing when when they when they gave the um, the position to Mordock, you know, that he was the candidate chosen. There was something. Um, where Officer Chang said, um, or, or Mordock tried to try to resist, you know, try to say, you know, really it it should be Wesley. Um, and Officer Chang said something really subtle that it it wasn't just that there were other things why he didn't why he came in second. And I it left me like going, what other what what is that about? Like where did he not I mean, every test along the way, he aced. You know, and he he, he, dro he dropped the ball with Oleana. That was the test he didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, yeah, you know, he's he's a professional. You know, he's there for you know, 
you know why he's there. He's going to wait. But yeah, I, I, just, wait. I just kind of wondered what, what because it wasn't explained. I wanted to know what that what that yeah. was. Um, but yeah, I I I thought uh, I I loved the makeup. I loved um, you know Mordock's makeup it was just one of my favorites that I've seen so far. Um, and he just you know really again brought the character out under all that latex. He didn't he didn't try to you know sometimes actors try to act through all, the mask. You know that the they they feel like they have to push big and do big gestures because you can't read through the mask mm -hmm. but he doesn't do that at all and it 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 was really really well done um and i lo i loved seeing patrick in his dress uniform i always i always just think that looks so good i love that um, yeah. i love that outfit yeah that's my take yeah i i um, I was waiting for Mordock to play that harmonica the whole time, and he just wouldn't play it. <laughs> what a tease. Some Dylan. <laughs> some Bob Dylan. Some, right? Yeah, some Bob. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been great. That yeah. would have been a great moment. That would have um, been. Of course, I love this episode because, you know, Jake's in it. You know, it's a Jake. <laughs> that, that's what yeah. I was screaming when I heard that. <laughs> it's a and Jake. I, and, and I finally got, uh, I might have to clip the card saying stay calm jake because i kind of like that um i might put that in my voicemail <laughs> um so basically i sum up this episode as uh an admiral wants to make the captain an admiral to be the commandant of a school with four kids and that's really basically what i so you know it boiled down to that uh, and uh that's the part of it that it was really confusing, you know, just like I was, it was underwhelming that it was only those four kids. And essentially, I guess they wanted Picard to be the officer chain. I, I just didn't get what exactly they were asking him to be and why they wanted him to give up command of all of this to run a school. It just felt really kind of out of place in that way. Um, but I do like, um, some of the performances. I really like the Wharf Wesley scenes. I like the moments of them together. I thought this commander Remick was, was good at getting under people's skin and really felt like an inspector general type of character. Um, how everybody was pissed that he was there, but he had the right to be there. So it's kind of like one of those things. Um, and yeah, I just, overall it was a good episode. It was, um, it took me a little bit, took me about 10 minutes to get warmed up. But after that, I started to get into it and started to enjoy it. We got to get, get Sirach to write the uh, IMDb synopses to uh, these episodes or like have a, a segment <laughs> where he gives us one of those gold nuggets every episode. Um, well, that's you know, it. My, yeah. Oh, one thing I was going to say, you know, my feeling about the like the Academy, like this this feels you know relva or wherever they you know land for this it feels like a a testing site like i i feel mm -hmm. i feel like the academy is somewhere else filled with lots of people mm -hmm. you know so that's the place i think that patrick would um you know i mean picard would go and um run you know on some that the 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 federation or mm -hmm. the academy is somewhere you know somewhere else I yeah, got the that. Academy's in San Francisco. It's not just, right. Yeah. <laughs> San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, that's where it is. Uh, and this was Relva 7, but I didn't really catch the details of all that, so I really couldn't speak on it. Um, but all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Eve, Chris, Muhammad, Jason, Allison, Carrie, Mai, Steve, Homer, and Faith. This has been a lot of fun. Everybody at home... For myself, for Denise, Sirach, Melissa, and Aaron, thank you all so much for joining us. And until next time, we're going to do our soap opera, hang on, stare at the camera. <laughs> Always remember, <laughs> seventh rule. <laughs>